Henry II of England and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, have created and ruled the Plantagenet Empire, the most dynamic, wealthiest, and most powerful kingdom in Western Europe. But the Plantagenets are rarely at peace, and Henry's temper and ego has long troubled his family and his people, from the shocking martyrdom of Thomas Becket to the vicious Great Rebellion that saw Eleanor sent to prison for 15 years. Meanwhile, their brilliant, avaricious, rebellious children have grown, fought, ruled, married, and even died, so that of his five sons, only two survive, Richard Lionheart and John Lackland. Now, as the 12th century enters its final decade, Henry himself dies leaving his great legacy poised at the edge of great success or great failure. Here's the story of what happens as Richard and John take their turns on the Plantagenet throne. Welcome back to season three of Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett and I want to tell you a story, an epic true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Season 3, Episode 1, Vivat Rex. On the sixth day of July in the year 1189, Henry II, Plantagenet King of England, Duke of Normandy, Duke of Aquitaine, Count of Anjou and Maine, died. He was 56 years old, and had been a king for more than half his life. It's not beyond reason to say that if he could have controlled his ego and his temper, he would easily be counted one of the very greatest of all English kings. As it was, on the very day he died, exhausted and beaten though he was, his kingdom was the envy of Europe. But that was all behind him now. The energy the brilliance, the daring, the care for the workings of government, the power, the agonizing losses. One wonders if anyone wept for him. One chronicler, writing twenty years later, said that Henry had been hated by all men by the time he died, although it may be fair to note that after his sons took their turns on the throne, attitudes toward the old man would soften. It's virtually impossible to imagine the remaining members of his family feeling anything except relief that he was gone. Of his eight legitimate children, he was survived by two sons and two daughters, Richard, aged 31, and John, a decade younger, along with the girls Eleanor and Joan, long since married and gone to other countries. He was also survived by his dry-eyed wife, a 65-year-old matriarch newly released from a decade and a half of imprisonment. It is true that she hadn't spent every day of those 15 years imprisoned. There are records that she traveled with Henry in the mid-1180s from one Eastertide to the next, after which he sent her back to her genteel jail. She was probably also freed for at least a few Christmas celebrations at Henry's court, and was led out for a time during Henry's misguided effort to saddle Normandy with both Richard and Geoffrey. Now her guards were remarkably astute. They unlatched the gates even before the order to free her arrived in the name of her favorite child, the new king, Richard. Courtiers bathed the scarred old lion Henry's corpse, dressed it in royal burial clothing, and fell in behind the family's chief spear carrier, William Marshall. The dead king, who had ridden these roads a thousand times, was taken from his beloved Chignon to Fontevrault's wooded valley. The famous abbey, founded generations ago thanks to the generosity of his wife's family, was to be Henry's burial site. Officials would have located his will, written in 1182, which made bequests to everyone from the Knights Templar and the Cistercians 
to what would presumably be a number of delighted poor women who needed dowries. Henry Plantagenet and Louis Capet are deeply human characters. We can admire devout, dutiful Louis, beset with a lifetime of difficulties which he surmounted thanks to sheer persistence. And we can feel the very modern pulse behind Henry's impatient, headstrong, egocentric passion to conquer his world. But the new King Richard is something else entirely. He had the dominating ego of his grandmother Matilda, his father's incandescent energy and temper, his mother's stone-hard determination, the benefits that come from generations of smart, tough, driven, clever forebears. What he doesn't show us is the charm or sensuality that makes so many of his ancestors so appealing, even when they're behaving badly. His biographer, Frank McLinn, describes the man as given to half-joking, half-serious tone with people. But you feel pretty sure that Richard wouldn't have laughed as his father did at the impudent cheek in a witticism about bastards and Tanner's daughters. He's a puzzle, this legendary Lionheart. Men were caught up by him while he lived, were willing to die as long as he led them. They believed glorious stories about him, wondered about him, troubadours sang about him. They even said he possessed legendary Excalibur, the sword once held in the very hands of King Arthur. Richard would go to his grave in 1199, just as the fabulous century of crusades and cathedrals, plantagenets and capets, troubadours and tournaments burned itself out and he is one of the very, very few humans ever alive whose name is recognized almost a thousand years later. Just the same, his soul waits off beyond the far hills, as indifferent to us as the crescent moon. We assume he stopped whatever he was about when the messenger sent by William Marshall arrived, begging his presence at Fontevrault. The chroniclers say that Richard had never believed his father was mortally ill, convinced that Henry was again lying and manipulating in another effort to control the world. The news that the old man had actually died must have come as a genuine surprise. This third son, the one who finally had won it all, traveled alone to the sparse wake, arriving in the middle of the night. He stood and looked at the familiar face, calm for once. Richard reportedly showed neither joy nor sorrow, according to the chroniclers, and was done paying his respects in no more time than it took to say a quick prayer. There's a legend that even this brief visit was marred by the bitterness between father and son, since people whispered that the corpse bled from its nostrils as long as the new king remained beside the bier. Gerald of Wales, who loathed Henry and his sons, broadcast that story, an open reference to an old wives' tale, that a corpse would bleed if the guilty party came near. For her part, the bereaved widow stayed entirely away. She surely felt more grief at the death of her sister Alex around this time than she did for Henry. Husband and wife would eventually lie close to each other once again, although not touching. But that was still many years off, on the other side of a different century. So it's Lionheart's turn on the magnificent stage. Eight centuries after their deaths, Henry Plantagenet and most of his brood are dimly known at best. Except for this one, our new King Richard I. Lionheart. We can find the lion this and the lion that among our noble medieval friends. Henry of Saxony, William of Scotland, William Marshall, all were called the lion. To us, who usually see lions dozing at the zoo, the big cats don't seem all that noble. But men from days much younger than ours thought they were splendid, fierce, proud, and bold, as one medieval writer said of them. Sporting their flashy sunray manes and frightening roars, 
They had awed puny humans since prehistoric men first charcoaled their unmistakable images on cave walls. Bestiaries Medieval encyclopedias of the natural world, filled with confident pronouncements on animal souls and minds, placed lions at the summit of that world. As such, their behavior was carefully parsed for moral lessons for their royal human counterparts. One of their most esteemed qualities in the medieval mind was the conviction that despite all its power, the lion was restrained in its anger and compassionate to its enemies. Given the medieval tendency toward almost unbelievable aggression, the lion's presumed character seems to have been lost on most human kings, but the king of beasts remained a powerful symbol for powerful men. So it was that lion images were splashed over armor and banners from one end of the known world to the other. Henry Beauclerk, among many, had adopted the lion as his marker. By the time Beauclerk's great-grandson Richard flew his scarlet banners, they were graced with not just one, but three rampant lions, claws fully extended, powerful jaws open in a roar, lashing tails caught whipping above their backs. Just as his contemporaries were obliged to do, we need to turn our eyes to this new king to consider what we can make of him. At the time he gains the monarchy, he's a decade older than his father had been when Henry's throne came to him. We think of Lionheart as one of the most English of all English kings. His heroic bronze statue guarding Britain's parliament building itself. But he was of Norman, Angevin, Aquitanian, and Scottish blood, spent most of his life in France, and would rarely set foot in England even during the decade he ruled it. One calculation holds that he was in that country for a total of six months, less than 200 days between his coronation and his death. What limited appeal it held for him lay in its royal title and its considerable wealth. He didn't even speak a word of the English of the day. But then we should be fair about the reality of Richard's royal power. Plantagenet kings had to focus on their tumultuous territories in France if they wanted to keep them. Historian John Gillingham makes the wry comment that the only English kings to spend much time in England in this period were the military failures forced back across the Channel by growing French power. Men of Richard's day had assumed that, merely a third son, he would live his life as the ruler of the Aquitaine an inheritance owed not to his father, but his mother. He was quite prepared for that role, as he'd come into that splendid legacy early. At the age of fourteen, his parents invited the world to Poitiers to watch their boy proclaim Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Poitou. It was a sumptuous ceremony in the century-old cathedral of St. Hilary, where it was his mother, not his father, who stood at his side, crowned, dressed in a blood-red cloak embroidered with the golden leopards of Anjou, carrying the scepter of the Aquitaine, a powerful symbol of the dukedom's traditional independence, despite Richard's vow of homage to Louis Capet. Before Richard was twenty, he was entirely comfortable with commanding others. That habit would never desert him, but perhaps it damaged him as much as it made him. There's such a thing as too much self-confidence. So much of what we think of him comes down to this from historian David Miller. If ever there was a man born to be a soldier, it was Richard. Richard's generalship is probably the one thing historians agree on. Quite a few don't like him at all. The 18th century eminent historian Edward Gibbon thought Richard's character was nothing but what Gibbon called brutal and ferocious valor. Lionheart has even been judged a total loss anywhere but the battlefield. To the extent he shaped his life, to the extent he felt real passion, it does seem focused on that one thing, fighting. His father was also a brilliant, fearless soldier, 
but we think of Henry as much for his government as his wars. While we don't remember or admire Richard as an administrator or a statesman, no, his ticket to immortality was his epic reputation for military genius, a talent doubled and doubled again by his astonishing personal courage. Even as a teenaged boy, nothing frightened him. He willingly spent his life enduring the wretched chaos of battlefields, of heat, cold, wounds, pain, scars. Friends left eyeless, magnificent horses killed, bitter women cursing as he passed. Richard brings to mind what Civil War historian Wilson Green once wrote about the Confederacy's Stonewall Jackson, describing Jackson's military greatness as compounded of speed on the march, discipline, decisiveness, belief in total victory, and personal bravery. Lionheart too had them all. Well, he may sound brutish at this remove, but his contemporaries didn't think so. Great lords fought. Not only was making war what they were raised to do, making war was what they had to do if they wanted to keep what they had. Those who shared Richard's world considered him intelligent and nicely educated, reasonably devout, quick-witted and decisive not at all a bad list of qualities for a king. Bertrand de Born, the troubadour who had been close to Richard's older brother and knew the boys well, joked that Richard's nickname should have been Yea and Nay, given his preference for short debates and quick decisions. Like his own father, the son of Empress Matilda, Richard was born of a beautiful, powerful, wealthy, worldly wise, and far older mother who doted on him. Maternal affection is one love that truly touches his heart. He loves his mother dearly, and pays her immense respect. She'll be found sitting at many of his council tables. For that matter, he even fondly remembers his wet nurse, a lady named Hodierna who will enjoy a royal annuity when her former charge becomes king. Unlike his careless father, Richard also likes to cut a dashing figure. When he gets to Cyprus, what was described as his gorgeous apparel, prancing steed, glittering saddle, and gold and silver sword will dazzle the locals. There are reports that even while on crusade, he refused to wear any color except his favorite, blazing red. His taste in clothes and accessories might come naturally from what an admirer of his day described as his tall, elegant build, remarking on his unusually long arms. He writes some poetry in his rare off hours, and is considered a talented musician with a surprising affinity for the refinements of the harp. As for his emotional life, there's no denying Lionheart wasn't all that interested in marriage. He was in his thirties by the time he married Berengaria of Navarre, and this in a day when princes were often husbands while still boys. The couple rarely spent time together, at least partly by choice, as far as we can tell, and had no children. The Chronicles reported quite openly that Richard shared a bed with Philip Augustus when they were young, friends then and allies. The chronicler, Roger of Hoveden, no fan of Lionheart's, also said, absent any further context, that Richard confessed the filthiness of his life in front of clergy while in Messina on his way to his crusade. On that collection of evidence, Richard was tagged a homosexual in the late 1940s, an interpretation that stuck with him. It's possible now to be less convinced. Men sharing a bed was commonplace in Richard's day of meager privacy, cold rooms, and scarce beds. Given long stretches away from women, homosexual adventures among young men of the day were viewed as a minor sin at worst, neither uncommon nor very important. However, 12th century chroniclers would have considered it an unnatural vice for an adult, especially a king. It would have been a topic of some note, which it wasn't. 
one might also assume that a male favorite would have won some mention. None exists. On the contrary, there are contemporary accusations of Richard raping local women during his violent clashes with rebels in his lands. And he fathered one bastard we know of, a son named Philip, the boy a mere shadow in history, likely named in honor of Richard's one-time friend and fellow king, Philip Augustus. There's a heroic story that Philip Plantagenet avenged his father's death by killing the rebel Vincomte of Limoges, but it feels more like myth than history. There's also a story first told by a Dominican friar that Richard was so taken with a lovely nun that she felt compelled to gouge her beautiful eyes out to drive him away. As for the Messina Confession reported by Hovden, once viewed as repentance for Richard's shame at his homosexuality, it can also quite reasonably support a second interpretation, that a lifetime of violence, rebellion, bloodshed, and heterosexual indulgence had best be formally repented and forgiven before his crusade turned serious. The confession was never noted by any of Hovden's peers, while Hovden himself, who apparently wanted to ensure Richard's reputation for evil, also accused Richard of the long-standing family tendency toward lust, saying that Richard carried off many women, even kinswomen, and made them his concubines before passing them to his soldiers. There is the matter of Richard's belated marriage. We reasonably should factor in his lifetime of exposure to his parents' frightening union, which would tend to give anyone pause. He was constantly at war from his teens, cutting into the time available for courting, and, as a royal prince, his marital fate largely rested in his father's hands. Henry Plantagenet displayed little interest in his third son's wedding to Elisa France, even as he rapidly married off the rest of his children, possibly due to the rampant rumors, probably true, that Henry had pulled Elise into his own bed. This evil could well have ruined any chance of a loving marriage between Richard and the victimized girl who'd become his father's mistress. As for Richard and the woman who did become his wife, Berengaria of Navarre, they had no children. But there are any number of possible causes, including their ages, the stresses of being on crusade in the early days of their marriage, and sheer bad reproductive luck. Still, Suspicions have never been entirely quashed that he's less of a lusty heterosexual than seems fitting for a lion-hearted king. His marriage, which began with great festivity, seems not to have suited either party. The couple spent so much time apart that were more startled by reports that they were together than reports that they weren't. He was often at war but even peacetime usually found them at a distance of a hundred miles or more. Anne Trindade, Berengaria's biographer, argues that the chronicles, carefully discreet, must point to concern over his sexuality. She believes that Richard's obsession with fighting provided an escape for what she feels would have been overwhelming sexual tension. Given that we'll never be entirely sure, it's another mysterious aspect of this deeply mysterious man. At the time he becomes king, our Lionheart has spent his life warring in the Aquitaine, determined to control the place. The adrenaline rush of danger combined with mastery of men under the brutal conditions of battle was irresistible to him. Fearless, tireless, brilliant at both strategy and tactics, observant, creative, adaptable. He subdued lord after lord, bringing what those nobles must have seen as a smothering cloak of oversight into their lives. The worst among them, Brabantines, Basques, Navarres, virtual land pirates, must have damned him to hell for interfering with their profitable habit of plundering Compostela pilgrims. Damn him all they would, he was an overwhelming force. The unconquerable fortress at Talberg, owned by the Rancons, was his in ten days, when he was all of twenty-two years old. Toulouse, 
always a thorn in the sides of Aquitanian and Plantagenet monarchs, finally bent, accepting Richard's domination. So did the pugnacious counts of Angoulême and Perigord. The hotheads in Limoges watched Lionheart tear their walls apart in retaliation for defying him. He even sent a parchment blast to the Pope, threatening that unless what he called the haughty monks of Canterbury learned their place, we will resolutely lay on them the hands of our royal severity. Just as we come to meet him, he's very impatient to leave on crusade, possibly just a bit vain that he was the first of his peers to answer the call to the Holy Land. Strength, speed, energy, courage, determination. Regardless of where he slept, no one ever denied that Richard Lionheart was indeed a lion of a man. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author Karen Markle Knapp. Thank you to Francis Butt for voicing our introduction and so much more. If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again September 16th for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts, including on YouTube with video episode trailers. Visit us on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me. Until next time, thank you for listening.